thank you very much. Uh, in my previous session, I introduced you to our work in the community. Today and this session is going to be focused on church vitality and I'm going to be drawing on the trends that we have seen over 25 years of doing research on the Australian church. Here's our vision. Thriving churches with a deepening understanding of their role and mission in a changing society. NCLS research exists to invest our work, our gifts and skills into the Australian church and beyond with the hope and dream that there will be better connection with our community. We are at heart mission researchers for the church. What I'll be drawing on in this session is information from our Australian National Church Life Surveys. Uh, for those of you who don't know about this work, I would suspect many of you do. Let me give you a snapshot of the most recent uh, Church Life Survey. And this is the, the information that has gone over many, time, many, many, many waves now. So as you may or may not know, we are the largest, longest running survey of church life in the world, which is pretty fantastic and extraordinary uh, commendation of the partnership across Australian churches over a very long period of time. 25 years old, now coming up to nearly 30 years old, uh, our most recent wave in uh, 2016, the way it works is you have lots of surveys go out to thousands of churches, 3,000 churches took part, quarter of a million people filled out survey forms. Uh, we had a kids survey form because the part of the goal is to hear the voices of the people. And so we said, well, we need to hear the voices of the kids as well. So we started with eight-year-olds. The kids younger than eight drew pictures of their church and provided that with us. So we had the full lifespan of people reflecting on their own experience of their faith and church life. Uh, what we did also in our, in our National Church Life surveys is denominations used that opportunity to actually put their own questions in the survey and find out from their own people. So we had a Baptist survey former Uniting Church one, Catholic one, on it goes. Uh, we translated, we also, in other community groups also used it to commission research to find out about particular areas of interest. So it becomes this extraordinary listening opportunity for the whole uh, faith community in Australia. Because we are a multicultural church, we translate it to 10 languages, and so that's part of the, the resource that we have. And that's in languages where the, that particular group uh, wouldn't be as confident in, in using an English survey form, so we targeted certain groups. So, for example, a South Sudanese language, Dinka, to listen to a, uh, the, that particular community. And most recently, we translated to two Burmese languages, Hakka Chin and Karen, and that was for those communities. And I just learnt last week, uh, back in Melbourne, the Baptists who said, please, we need that, uh, that translation, they have a church of a 1,000 Chin-speaking people in Victoria, one of their largest churches. So we're, that's just a really interesting insight into, into the church today. What I'm going to do in this session is two things. Firstly, I'm going to give you six features of the Australian landscape. And I feel like one of those moments where um, it's like, you know, six things that you didn't know about the church, number four will surprise. You know, it's one of those hook things that I'm going, I'd be interested and I'll pause after this to see which ones perhaps do surprise you? These are these moments where you go, oh, um, people go, oh, I knew that. And you go, well, you didn't know it until we did the research and told you that. And it becomes part of the accepted knowledge of what you know. But I'll be interested and go, of these things I'm about to tell you, I think some will surprise. I think there's some new features that we have learned. After that, I'm going to give you a wider picture of what are we seeing over decades of work in church life. Here we go, six features of the Australian church landscape. Number one feature, church attendance has begun to plateau. We have got multiple sources of estimates of church attendance that we've been tracking over some time. Here's the first source. We have surveys that go out into the wider community of panels of Australians and we ask them, like the, the material that I shared earlier from the Australian Community Survey, about whether people go to church. This picture here shows from 1950 right through to 2019 and we can see that when you ask someone if they go to church, that that self-reported attendance, that the rate of decline has slowed. That's one source of data. 
Another source of data, that's monthly attendance. Now let's come to weekly attendance. We've been collecting head counts. Thank you to all of you who have shared your uh, information about head counts within the churches, different denominations. We've been collecting that as carefully as we can. What you see here is the decline in weekly attendance has now plateaued. So we've told the story for the last decades that church attendance has declined. And you will have understood that narrative. Change that narrative today. Church attendance has plateaued. That's where we're sitting at the moment. Second key feature, Protestant churches are growing. First time I've been able to say that in 30 years of work. We have growing churches overall. Let me unpack that for you a little bit. Here's the picture. Yes, when we look at the Catholic Church, which is the largest church attending group in Australia, and mainstream Protestant churches, which include Anglican, Uniting, Lutheran, and some Presbyterian, you see that decline trend. And that relates to an ageing profile as well. That continues over the last uh, 25 years. That's the green line and the purple line are Catholic and mainstream. Sorry, everybody else. Other Protestant is bundled all together, Baptist, Salvation Army, Adventist, uh, Church of Christ, on we go. We see moderate growth over 25 years. When we come to the Pentecostal movements, what we see is high growth. Over the 25-year period since 1991, the Pentecostal churches, when considered together, have doubled in size. Now, when you put that story together, what you get is the net effect is Protestants are growing. So see the blue line that tips up at the end? That's a story of growth when you combine all Protestant churches together. My third feature, the size order of the top five denominations in Australia has changed over the past 25 years. Here it is. In 1991, if you count the number of people who go to church, uh, you have Catholic, Anglican, Uniting, Baptist, ACC. ACC, for those of you who may not be familiar, Australian Christian churches used to be Assemblies of God. When you count all Pentecostal churches, ACC is half of all Pentecostal churches. Now, I'm not counting them together at this moment. I'm counting them as a single denomination, which they are. So ACC was fifth. Roll forward to 2016 when we did the last estimates. Catholic ACC is second largest single denomination in Australia at the moment, followed by Anglican, followed by Baptist, followed by Uniting. That is a changing shape of the Australian church in a relatively short time. That's the impact of that incredibly high growth. Now, I've already been asked, what is the impact of Hillsong on this picture? Hillsong is part of the ACC. In 2016, Hillsong has been part of the ACC. They have been an ACC congregation. Uh, since then, Hillsong has uh, moved to be independent. We will see what happens, but I'm not expecting that picture to change dramatically even when Hillsong is taken out of those ACC figures. Uh, ACC will not drop back to number five, for example. Hillsong will then be one of the, larger, of the smaller denominations. Hillsong will be now counted as perhaps large as some of our other small, smaller Protestant denominations. Those five account for 68% of all church attenders. Shape of church is changing. And I know that's new because I didn't know that a little while ago. So there we go. Here's another feature of the Australian church landscape. Inflow of new arrivals has been largely stable. This is perhaps an unexpected one when you think, well, if we've been declining or what's going on here, what do we know about people joining churches? Here's a picture over 25 years. We have different types of inflow. We have people who change churches but stay within the same denomination. We call those transfers. You go from an Anglican church to another Anglican church. That's transfers. That's the green line, and you can see the picture of the green line. 1996 here I've got to 2016. Switches are people who change denominations, and that's been, that's the blue line, which is relatively stable as well over time. Newcomers are people who were not in church in the previous five years. They have come into church having had either no church background or having been away from church perhaps since they were a child, okay? So they are new to church life in the last five years. This is, your, you know, this is the line we're most interested in. See that orange line? 
fairly flat over the time period, the inflow into church life and the movement around churches is fairly stable. You do note the visitor line has had a bit of a uh, decline there from 5% down to 3%. What's a visitor? <laughs> What's a visitor to church? <laughs> Someone who describes themselves as a visitor when you say, what do we have this combination of questions and we ask about how long you've been there, etc. And they go, I am visiting this church. So, yes, that's right. That's right. So they, they are visiting the church. Let's still do a little bit deeper into that newcomer figure because with the context of being tougher for church life, when we go a little bit deeper, we do see some erosion. So this is a Protestant... Uh, the Protestant line is the uh, blue line and there's an overall line. So you can see when you round up that orange line, you get that 6% which I showed you. But once you go to one decimal point and once you have a look, uh, you can see there is some erosion. So for those of you who go, I'm, it doesn't make sense to me that we're still getting the same inflow of newcomers, there's a story there to be aware of. It is getting tougher, but I still want to give a basic at the high level. The story is that inflow into churches is stable. People are still trying churches is my top message for you today. Fifth feature of the Australian learned ch church landscape, local church leaders see themselves as effective in their roles. We're talking minister, pastor, priests or lay leaders who are in the senior leadership role. Here is the picture. They rate their effectiveness highly. When you say from very low to very high, how would you rate your overall effectiveness? in your present role over the last few months, we get a picture where they're saying, I think I'm very effective. <laughs> Give them their moment. They also say, I'm really stressed, but I'm really satisfied in my ministry. Sixth feature of the Australian church landscape, current church attenders are more likely to be positive about their church experience now compared to 20, 25 years ago. Here it is. All of these indicators of church vitality were higher. And I'll go into these in more detail. But when you ask about their growth in faith, whether they're inspired in worship, their service, their engagement, they're looking for opportunities to engage beyond themselves, commitment to the vision, all of those, there are higher proportions of church attenders in church today who are positive about those aspects of church life than 25 years ago. Let me pause there, get you just take a couple of minutes to talk with someone next to you and just go, what do you think of those six features I've given you? What were some of the surprises? What's your first reaction to those six features that I've done? Just have an engagement at the moment and get, give your first reaction. You go away and think about this, but first reaction, what do you think? on your heads. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, the old teacher trick worked. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm not going to invite you to speak at this moment, but who was surprised by any of those six features that I put out? Were there any surprises in the room? Okay. Let me now move on to the second part and the most substantial part of what I'd like to share with you which is to do a review of church health. Now, as well as doing a review and informing you, I'm going to go a bit further this morning. I'm going to actually suggest some strategic responses. I'm going to take us to the so what. Now, you can see I've been a little bit tentative here. I've gone with some possible strategic responses, all in brackets, because I'm aware that there is such a wealth of wisdom in the room and such a wealth of wisdom with uh, leaders who are reflecting deeply and who have many sources of information and knowledge uh, that, 
that they are using to discern where we go from here. But I'm speaking to a room of people that I believe are strategic leaders in our church. So I'm taking our conversation to that point and saying, when I give you a whole lot of information, which there will be a whole lot, and don't panic, we will send it out to you. It will be available online. So you're not trying to capture it all this morning. I want to push it to the so what. So I'm going to give you some first so what out of this information. The first thing I want to reflect on is the people in church life. First finding that is familiar perhaps to many of us is that there is a significant gap between the church and community and that gap continues. When you look at women and men, the Australian population is about 50-50. In church life, 60% women, 40% men. Now, women have always been more religious than men. That is true in every religion around the world. Australian Christianity is not exceptional in that, but it's one of the realities of our life. Education gap. You can see church attenders are highly educated. 37% of church attenders have a university degree. University degree. That compares to an increasingly educated Australian population who have come up to 25%. We are highly educated. That is a challenge, particularly when you are working in churches, perhaps where you have some older generations who have only primary school education as their highest level of education. And yet you are talking to this increasingly highly educated group and the younger generations are the ones who even have more education. That is an extraordinary challenge for our local ministers, pastors, priests who are trying to teach and preach to that breadth of experience. That is a challenge, that gap. The age gap is also a significant challenge for us. When we look at church life, this chart shows the uh, church is the orange line. Uh, it's from 15-year-olds up to 80-plus-year-olds. The green line is the community. And what you can see with just looking at that cross in the line is church attenders are much older than the wider community. We can pull that down to looking at those over 60. About half of church attenders are over 60 compared to 26%. This is a key driver for the future, that age profile. The second demographic key driver for the future that I really want to highlight is ethnicity. So in the churches, we have more people born in a non-English speaking country than uh, in the wider community. What we see is increasing ethnic diversity, not only in Australia, which Mark talked about earlier, but we see it within the church. And I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for the church. We have perhaps the highest proportion of multicultural churches, I think, in the world. For example, we have 28% of our churches can be um, described as multicultural. When you compare that to the US, they have 14% who are multicultural churches. We are a highly multicultural expression of, of church life. And in those multicultural churches, we're doing research particularly on ethnic diversity and cultural diversity at the moment because we see it as so significant for the future of the church. What we know from those multicultural churches is that to be the more multicultural you are, the more ethnic diversity you have in the church, that there is a positive relationship with vital faith, vital worship, and having young people. We know in the NCLS that our monocultural non-Anglo churches are underrepresented, and we hope to do better next time in terms of representing the voices and the communities who are non-Anglo monocultural. So here's my first two uh, comments that for the future of, our, of churches, the key demographic drivers that we have to attend to is an ageing profile, which is a challenge for the future. And I'm going to say ethnic diversity is the opportunity for flourishing. How we engage those issues strategically and attend to those will determine where our church ends. And while I've been able to say today that church... Uh, attendance, the decline is slowed, and even in the Protestant churches, we see some growth happening. The tough news is with that age profile, that plateauing will not last. We have a decline. It's like a, we're on a slippery slope where we've gone down, we're flat for a while. Unless something dramatic changes, we will go down again. That's just a demographic factor and that's where the conversation about generational transmission of faith comes in and how we pass on the power 
to the next generations as well. How we engage a different kind of church. Let me come to healthy churches now. I've looked at those demographic features. I'm going to speak now about healthy churches. Now, we can have a whole conversation about what do you mean by what is a healthy church? And I'm going to make it very simple this morning. You can read our paper on models of church vitality where we did a literature review of all the ways that people describe church health. And while there are many, many ways, the seven this, the 12 that, the 15 this, we've got our own lists, etc. In the end, I reckon we can boil it down and make it quite simple, which as we've talked about is often quite useful to make it quite simple there's up there's in there's out healthy churches a church that is healthy should be helping people in their relationship with God they should be helping people in their relationship with each other and with the wider community up in out so that's how I've organized the information I'm going to be sharing with you around those three dimensions of well how healthy is the church where are we going uh, using these three sort of ways of thinking about it. So let's look at the key one, relationship with God, and look at faith and worship as examples of how has the church been going in this area. What we see in Australian church life is that discipleship and spiritual life continues to be central, and the heart of Christian churches continues to be gathering regularly around Jesus. When we ask attenders, what do you value about church life? What comes out on top is sharing in Holy Communion or Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. You see, we've got to work across 20 different faith traditions, so we use language that people can connect with. But that sharing in that significant um, feast together and sermons, preaching and Bible teaching, core practices of the church is what attenders value. And when we say, what do you think this church should focus on in the next 12 months? Pick one thing that's the priority for our local church to focus on. What comes on top? Spiritual growth. This is still core in the church. And when we look at the pattern over the last few decades, what we see is that, that this is going to be a picture you see over and over again where I'm following the trend line over time. What you can see is the proportion of attenders who say, my local church has been helping me grow in my faith has increased over time. And what we know from our research is that people who say they're growing in their faith, that happens over the whole lifespan, every generation, which is a beautiful thing, I think, that our continuing depth of spiritual faith and walk with God continues over a lifetime. We also know from our newcomers, those new people, what they want is spiritual growth. They want input. It's part of why they're there. We also know family members are key for sharing faith. When you find out why someone is a Christian today, who is the role model? It's a family member. It's their mother first, followed by their father, other family members, often grandparents, and they say, these are the people who showed me what faith was about and passed on faith to me. This is key. If we want to invest in the spiritual life, this is key. Let's have a look at worship. What we see, again, when we ask church attenders about their worship experience, you see an incredibly sharp line increasing. That's just the proportion of people who say, I experienced inspiration during my worship service. And I think this is an interesting one to think about because... What I think has been going on in church life is that there has been an investment in, the share, in music and creativity and aesthetics, and you see the traditions borrowing from each other. You know, all the churches across every faith tradition will still sing Hillsong songs, but you also have the neo-monastic Baptist traditions. You have the meditative practices, that you have people joy, jo journeying with um, uh, a cappella, Taze, Iona, lots of other resources coming in and informing it. You have liturgical practices in Baptist churches, responsive readings. We have people experimenting. Then you have things such as messy church, um, different things where people are engaging and expressing worship in all sorts of creative ways, using all sorts of resources. So I think this is an encouragement in terms of uh, what the churches are doing. And if we just look at the Protestant church, we actually see um, whether it's God's presence in worship, helpful preaching, growth in understanding and inspiration, all of those factors are actually increasing. Now, there is a question. 
Is this just the people who were there are happy and the people who didn't like it have been pushed out and left? I think we have to own that that is a possibility for some. That you do it for, you know, you stay there if you love it and some people are pushed out um, or have to find somewhere else to go. But I also think that we should overall, my uh, belief is that this is an area that churches have been working on and improving. And we also know that worship services are the key place that newcomers come to. Worship services are a key and core mission activity. So here's my two strategic responses when it comes to how do we invest in the faith and worship life of the church. The first one is help families share faith with family members. I think we miss the boat when we only try and equip people to share faith with others. We need to practice and learn and invest in helping families share faith with family members because this is where it happens most and this is key. And I, I don't think a lot of our traditions are, are actually investing and thinking about how to resource our churches in this area. I think that could be a strategic response. The second one is to recognise that while we are engaging in mission in incredibly creative and, it's, and beautiful ways, the worship service itself is a core mission activity of the church. It continues to be so. I know sometimes we think it's for insiders or we have to work out how to move beyond, but it is in reality a core mission activity of the church that we have to make understand that that newcomer, that visitor, is walking in and making an evaluation about our, our faith based on their experience of worship. That's where how we invest in that is really key as a strategic response. Let me move to my second uh, key dimension of church health and vitality, which is the drawing people in, relationship with each other. And here I'm going to be speaking about belonging and involvement. When we ask people about, do you feel you have a strong and growing sense of belonging to your church? See that line? It's going up. Over time, more people experience strong and growing belonging in church life. What do our newcomers tell us? You see, I always give the newcomers a voice. Newcomers say, I want social activities. What do you want here? What do you want the church to be doing more of? Their priority, social activities. I want to meet people. Behaving and belonging come before believing. There it is again. Start there. I also would note, while I highlighted some of the key features of multicultural churches, that they are places where there's vital faith, vital worship, young people, we also have learnt that there is a negative relationship between being a multicultural and having strength in vital connections with each other. What that says to me is if multicultural church or our ethnic diversity, cultural diversity in churches, if we want to harness that, we have to be more attentive strategically to uh, working on relationships between people of different cultural backgrounds within our churches because we're not quite getting that right. Here's the second one I want to talk about here, involvement. This is uh, a key area where I'm going to focus on Protestant churches because it's a little bit different in the Catholic churches. Over the period from the 25 years, there's a massive change in how people are engaging in small groups. What you see here is the blue line is the proportion of uh, attenders who go in, who are in part of social groups is about, it's fairly stable. And let me just point out, what I'm doing is I'm only highlighting things where there's about a three or more percent change because everything in our database is statistically significant. You know, half a percent change, one percent change, two percent, it's all significant. It's all, we could make a noise about all of it. So I've actually focused on what's more important and where there's more substantial change, okay? So this is why I'm highlighting this. So there's a fairly stable line there. But what you see is this incredible increase in the proportion of Protestant church attenders in small groups. And that makes me reflect on what is going on here. I think that it's like it's a bit been discovered to be an incredibly useful tool, incredibly useful way of being church together. It feeds intimacy, chance to get to know people better, relationship. It works for individuals. I think it feeds people who can pitch at different educational levels. It's a place where you can discuss and deepen faith. 
So here's my two strategic responses here. Giving ongoing attention to helping people belong. So number one is, here's one strategic thing I think we can encourage our churches to do. Provide newcomers and returnees ways to meet people. Opportunities simply to meet and deepen relationship with people. And the second one is that uh, feature that I've already described, which is build relationships within multicultural churches. This is part of a future healthy church picture and we have to be intentional and strategic and help our churches build cross-cultural, intercultural communication and trust and that will be part of building a healthy church into the future. If we don't attend to that, then this beautiful, incredible opportunity of the Australian church to be a multicultural church, uh, we'll, we will lose that opportunity if we don't do the relational work. So let me pause there and give you again a chance to just have a chat with each other about what I've just said about those strategic responses. What would your responses be or what do you think about the ideas I've given you? Do they resonate um, around the areas of uh, faith and worship, the up dimension, relationship with God, and the in dimension, relationship with each other? We'll have one more chance to do a bit of a, a buzz, buzz session like that and I might even open it up for a few final com um, comments and questions as well at the end. Okay, let me move on to our third dimension that I'm speaking to about the health and vitality of Australian churches and looking at the trends uh, in the area of out. How are we going at our relationship with the wider community? And I'll be focusing on both the hands and feet the word and deed, witness and service. Firstly, let's look at service. There are a number of ways of thinking about how we are being the hands and feet of Christ, being salt and light and yeast in the community. We can do it informally. And when we look at church attenders who are informally offering acts of service to the wider community, again, you see an incredible increase in the proportion of church attenders who are serving their communities in this way. And what I'm talking about things here is, I go, did you in the last 12 months, you know, care for someone who was sick, visit someone in a hospital, write to an MP, give money, help someone in crisis? Informal acts of service are on the increase. Interesting to reflect on why. We can also serve together as groups, as, as collectives, if you like, where we join Meals on Wheels, Amnesty International, our local op shop, uh, etc. The men's shed. What we see in here is quite interesting over time. We see two things. Firstly, the proportion of people involved in community-based groups. So these are ones where it's the community is the host, if you like, or they're the ones who own it and who run it. Church attenders are amongst, can I say, the highest levels of volunteers in the nation. You want to find a volunteer, find a church attender. And far from the myth that church attenders are only turned inwards, the evidence continues to be over and over again that church attenders are not only serving within their congregations, they are the busiest, most active people serving beyond their congregations. I think that's an important myth to, to bust in terms of that where church attenders are. They are living out faith in the wider community and that continues. So we see whether it's social justice or advocacy groups, which is the green line, fairly stable over time. The blue line is care, service, service or welfare groups, fairly stable. The same proportion of church attenders are involved in those kind of activities. Here's the interesting trend I've noticed though and want to pull out for you. There's been an increase in the proportion of attenders involved in church-based service groups over time. It was the same back here and then it started to go up. And I've been thinking and scratching my head about what's going on in this picture. What is going on? Are we going, oh my goodness, the community doesn't like us anymore. What do we go? We can't talk to them. We don't know how to talk to them. We don't know what to say. Uh, all right, we'll show them we love them with our, with our actions, 
They'll know we're Christians by our love. We'll, we'll do stuff. So, okay, we'll build bridges by doing things. That is perhaps a positive response. Perhaps it's also coming out of a place where the church is a little bit panicky and going, we don't know what to do, so we'll start a thing. We'll start a group, we'll start something, and we'll reach out to our community, but where we'll start things. And I just wonder, both from a positive side, where I think our actions do speak loudly, and we know the community tells us, when you actually care and advocate for those who are marginalised, who are oppressed, who do not have access to the same resources, then we respect you for that. Even if we don't agree with you, we respect you for your actions. We know that to be true. But why are we doing it all ourselves? I wonder, what is the implication for the future if churches are running all of these things ourselves? And I wonder what that's going to mean if we do move to a place where we aren't joining the local community uh, in terms of their actions and participating with them, but sort of going inside and running them all from inside. So that's an important trend I think we need to watch. Here's the one line that's going down. You've seen all my lines going up. Here's the one that's going down. When we come to word, come to speaking about faith, well, let me go first. We see that, in fact, those who look for opportunities, the proportion has increased, which is quite interesting. We see the proportion who have, are involved in um, evangelistic activities has increased, just slightly, but those things have actually increased. What has gone down over time is the proportion of attenders who actually have invited someone to church. So with the very strong message that I've been trying to share to say, try inviting them, that is the key when I see this trend, I see a church that has lost confidence in itself and is not speaking out in a way which is the, hey, I love my church, which they clearly do. I love my church. It is helping me grow in my faith. I find belonging here, but I am not confident to invite you to come. That's going down. I think that's a big challenge for us to engage. So what do I see in terms of strategic responses with this area of witness and service, the word and deed? The first one is encourage inviting others. And that's where the community information that we shared that says actually Australians may not be, uh, if you have relationship with them, you are friends or family members, they may be more open than you think if you actually invite them to an event, to music, to food, that it comes out of relationship and friendship that they may be open to that and they'll do it for you as a first step. That, I think, is something that we can come back to. I'll throw out, just because I don't know what it means, but that we volunteer both in church and community groups, that we encourage our people to continue to be present. And it is our older attenders, particularly in our mainstream churches, who are the best, most faithful, most prolific long-serving volunteers in the community. They are absolute gift to our society and when they are no longer with us, will our younger generations continue to pick up that volunteer safety net which our society relies on? We pull that out and we, we, it will have a massive impact on Australia. What is going to happen generationally with our volunteering practices and do we do it from inside? or outside, or both? Just a question. The last one comes to this issue of evangelism, evangelization, witness, and we had a fantastic conversation earlier in our panel, I think, about this. But I, I would like to reflect on what I think strategically we need to work on as churches is to help people find words to express the way they act. What we learn here is that the actions are present. People are living out faith through their lives, in their actions, but they are not connecting the words. They are not, don't have the vocabulary and the confidence to witness, to say to their friend, this is why I do what I do. When we walk over the Harbour Bridge for reconciliation, we are invisible as church. When we take action, we tend to be invisible. How do we find the words to say, this is why I do what I do? I am a person of faith, and because of my faith, I am here 
standing for the refugee, standing for the marginalised, serving in this soup kitchen, whatever it is, how do we find the natural, authentic ways to speak about why we do what we do? That's the challenge. It's like a bicycle where we've got one wheel on and one wheel that's a bit wobbly in terms of the, the word and deed. In 1991, we had a conversation. The questions were in our surveys about, well, is it about evangelism or social action? Where are you now? We've thrown those questions out. That is not the conversation the church is having. We see an integration of word and deed practice. And for those who sort of go, oh, that particular tradition, they do all the, you know, the deed stuff and they do all the sort of the speaking evangelism stuff, that ain't true anymore. That's another myth that needs to be busted, that there is high integration across all faith traditions of both word and deed, people finding their way into an integrated expression. But we need to... We're not quite there in terms of our words. Let me come finally to positioning for the future. Where are we at? Well, I'm looking here at vision, innovation and leadership culture. We have learned over the 25 years of doing research that when we find local churches that have built a culture where there is a readiness to act, a, a positioning for the future, we, they have what we call a culture of collective confidence. I like to call it the yes we can factor. It's where it's not I and my faith, it's we here together are clear about who we are, where we're going, what we are being called to in our context and we are enabled and equipped to move ahead and we're open to having a go. When you find that, you know, if, there is, if there's any lever or magic button to push, this is it this culture of collective confidence. It's a collective characteristic. How are we going as a church when we put us all together in these key areas? So we always have a look. How's this church going on commitment to vision, owning, knowing there's a vision and being committed to it, oh, being open to new possibilities? What we see is there's been an increase over the decades of church attenders who say, I know what the vision is of my church and I'm committed to it. That has gone up. In some traditions, it's just soared incredibly. It's like being this massive engagement with we have to think about this and, and discern who we are and where we're going. And innovation, again, a very high spike from 13% in 2001 to 22% in 2016. Increasing position of openness to going, we are ready to have a go. Our leaders are open. Now, what that means may be very different. It may be we're willing to move the chairs a little bit or, you know, the table can go three feet to the left or something. I'm not saying it's, you know, they're willing to tear out the pews, but I'm saying they see themselves as open and perhaps we should take them at their word, take them when they say we are open to trying something new, that that is more and more attenders are saying that and believe their church is ready as well. When it comes to leadership, what we see in terms of an important empowering of, of the people, we see the proportion who have leadership or ministry roles has been stable. And we also see those who agree, my gifts and skills are encouraged here. I, I see that I've been equipped and empowered with my gifts and skills to contribute to this community. That has also been stable. So I guess there's a message there that is, look, this is not a... a, a point for celebration. At least it's being maintained, but I think it's an ongoing journey. In, um, in our most recent wave, in, well, in the last wave in 2011, we could see actually a decline in that empowering indicator. And we said to the churches, guys, what's going on? This has been declining over time. And what is it? Why are particularly younger people saying, I do not feel as empowered? I do not feel. And I think that's there's a whole lot of reasons. Maybe nothing had changed and it was a perception thing or maybe leaders were starting to hang on a bit tighter and not actually passing on and enabling their people to contribute. I don't know, but what I was very encouraged by was when we got to 2016, we see that line popping up again. And so my story to you is it's stable. This is again why it's important to do work over time, but you see the trends are changing and moving. And I think it's the story of our church and you can have a feel intuitively, you're going, this feels right with where we're up to. Here's the st strategic responses. Build a culture of collective confidence. 
I would encourage us to go, how can we help our churches to not only clarify their vision, but align all their activities around it? Over and over again, we find there's this intentionality that actually makes a huge difference when you say, this is where we're going. And if what we do does not align with that, we're going to stop doing it. Next one, start new initiatives. We know from our work on church plants, new worship services, new things, when you have a new wine skin, it's a good thing. You don't have a whole lot of baggage. You have a group of people who are clear about their vision, strong in their belonging, and actually going forward. So starting new things is uh, a useful, I think, strategy. I think the conversation has moved also from going, how do we make them change? How do we make that group change now? And you go, I'm at the point of going, you know, you don't always have to do that. You, don't, you can let people be who they are. Change is incredibly hard, incredibly hard. And so sometimes I think there's a time to say, look, some of our churches will need palliative care in this next period. They do now, and that will be the strategic response to have palliative care teams and, and approaches for some of our churches. Some of our churches need to be helped to continue doing what they're doing well and not being asked to change. And then I think strategically we have to be willing uh, to release resource to enable new things to start. That's, I, I, I believe, the evidence is there that this is an effective approach as well. Finally, equip and empower lay people. This is the force that we have, the goodness that we have, the giftings that we have amongst us that we have to continue to release. So if I just cap it off, Overall, what we see is signs of health are stronger than before across relationship with God, relationship with each other, and relationship with wider community. Some things stable, some things increasing. Collective confidence is increasing in the church. We see both vision, innovation, and leadership, which is stable, but the other areas increasing. This is a positive story of the churches in Australia. We started in a tough place this morning, hearing how we are viewed by the wider community. We are in a place here where the message is across the years of doing the National Church Life Survey, we see a church that has. Well, let me just summarise here. So my strategic responses. Help families share faith with family members. Invest in worship services as a core mission activity. In terms of that's the up dimension. The in dimension Provide newcomers with ways to meet people. Build relationships in multicultural churches across groups. When we come to the out dimension, relationship in the wider community, encourage inviting others. Build the confidence to do that. Volunteer both in church and community groups. And we need to continue to work on helping people find the words to express why, how they, why they act. Finally, when we come to positioning for the future, the culture of collective confidence is, is what we're seeking and trying to learn from churches who are doing this well. Clarifying vision, aligning activities around it, starting new initiatives and equipping and empowering. So overall, what do we see? We see a consolidation across church life. I think the conversation about the church is changing and the context is changing, that's been accepted. We're beyond that now. Highlight that age and ethnicity are key demographic drivers for the future. How we engage those two issues will determine the shape of the future church. What our churches have been doing is attending to the core practices of mission, discipleship, service and worship. And I see intentionality about the work of the church in these areas. I see the intentionality about a church positioning itself for mission. Now, whether or not the hoped for outcomes will come to be, remains to be seen. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave you? I guess you've heard already I'm a bit of a glass half full sort of girl. So you can take the optimistic view or the pessimistic view of whether how tough this is. But I wonder if there's a creative tension in all of this where we are both honest and hopeful. We are realistic and yet courageous. We focus on the immediate issues that we do need to attend to and yet in the context of this conversation, while I've been talking about 25 years of work, it's a drop in the ocean when we remember the long story of the church in mission in history. 
and that God is sovereign and God continues to be sovereign no matter what we do. Thank you.